Curiosity. Are you asking questions about your health? What about your kids' health? Are you able to ask questions to your healthcare provider? Are you getting the answers that you need? And is your provider asking you good questions? I'm a homeschool mom, and I know that asking questions is how you start learning. My guest on this podcast episode is Dr. Lawrence Pilevsky. He has been a holistic pediatrician for over 20 years. He's on the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine and past president of the American Holistic Medical Association. In addition to his own medical practice, he teaches holistic and integrative medicine to parents and professionals, both nationally and internationally. He's very curious and encourages his patients to be curious too. And in my opinion, that's one of the best qualities to have in a healthcare provider. He has an incredible story about becoming a holistic practitioner after seeing so many red flags in the mainstream medical system. We're going to cover some health topics that you honestly don't hear doctors talk about that often. I think this episode will answer a lot of the questions that you already have but haven't been given answers to. I'd encourage you to do a couple things as you start into this episode. One, put your curious hat on, so to speak. And two, See it through to the end, because I think you'll really appreciate his parting words to us as we wrap up the conversation. Welcome to the Daily Wellness Podcast, where you can learn about healthy living and be inspired to take the next step in your wellness journey. Good morning, everyone. I have Dr. Polensky with me today. I'm so honored to have you on the Daily Wellness Podcast. Thanks for joining. Hello, good morning, and thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. Yeah, I would love for everyone to get to know you. I've shared a little bit, but can you kind of share what you feel is important for us to know about you? Well, I'm uh, I'm born and raised in New York. Uh, Lived here practically my whole life. I went to college in New York. I went to medical school in New York. I did my residency in New York, and um, most of my medical career was in pediatric emergency medicine and pediatric uh, neonatal intensive care medicine mm-hmm. and inpatient pediatrics and outpatient pediatrics, delivery room medicine, and uh, a lot of teaching of medical students and residents. And slowly but surely, the critical thinking in my life seeped in and um I started to have lots of questions about what I was seeing in medicine and that didn't fit with how I was trained. And uh, I needed to find answers and I went and found answers and realized Western medicine wasn't where the answers were. So I went on this huge journey of learning about Chinese medicine and homeopathy and naturopathy and osteopathy and herbal medicine, all the other opathies, only to realize that the answers to what I was seeking actually were in the teachings of Western medicine. We just didn't practice it. Mm. So I've been in practice for over 20 years, taking care of kids with a holistic approach, which basically means that I don't view symptoms as something to eliminate or suppress. Mm -hmm. I view symptoms as information, as a way to understand the physiology of the body, what the body needs and uh, attempt not to suppress those symptoms, but to understand that that the body needs support and to facilitate those symptoms to resolve rather than make them go away. And it's a a different philosophy because our understanding of the body in Western medicine is symptom is bad, treat it, go away. Mm -hmm. The way that I practice, the symptoms are actually the body's attempt to resolve a dis-ease or discomfort. So the role is not to stop the symptom, but to support the body so the body gets better. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. What were some of the questions and like incongruencies that you felt like as you were going through training in the beginning of your medical career? Well, I remember in 1991 when I was a fellow in pediatrics at NYU, uh, we mandated the hepatitis B vaccine for all newborns. Now, I had no idea vaccines were a problem at that time, but I sort of looked at my colleagues and said, hey, wait a second, 
uh, hepatitis B infection is not a problem in pediatrics. Every other vaccine we've given has always been in response to a known disease state in that population. Why are we giving this vaccine to kids when it doesn't affect them? And we can always check the mother's status while she's pregnant to see if the baby's at high risk. And people were just like, uh, I, I don't know. And then four years later, when I ran into a pediatrician who had trained me in uh, medical school 10 years before, I said to him, Mike, are you giving the hepatitis B vaccine in your office? And he said, yeah. I said, but Mike, it makes no sense medically. He said, I know. I said, then why are you doing it? And he said, because we have to. Mm. So those were things. And you know, in the early 90s, when, when I was in the ER as a physician, I would see kids in the ER as if they were using it for their primary care. Mm -hmm. Kids would come in, they'd have an illness, I'd diagnose an otitis media, an ear infection, I'd give them antibiotics, and two or three weeks later, they'd come back, sick again. And I was taught, okay, you must have a resistant infection, mm -hmm. so I give you another antibiotic. So I did it. And then three weeks later, they come back and they were sick again. And I would step back and say, hold on a second. These kids don't look sick enough to need another antibiotic. They don't look like they have a bacterial process going on. And so I found e pediatric ear, nose, and throat doctors who were actually starting to practice differently. They were looking at the literature in Europe. And they were starting to realize that otitis media may not be an infection and in fact, most of the time, it's not an infection. And so then in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, all these articles started to come out in the American literature showing otitis media is not an infection wow. most of the time. And here we are in 2023, and pediatricians and family docs are still not paying attention to the literature. And we're over 30 years into this literature, and kids are getting antibiotics needlessly. That was another thing. 1998, a mother came to me and said, Dr. Larry, did you know there's mercury in vaccines? I started medical school in 1983. 15 years later, I'm finding out there's mercury in vaccines. And so instead of just saying, ah, come on, there's nothing to do with anything. I said, well, what else is in there? And so 25 years later, I have found an amazing, amazing amount of literature that shows concern about the health and safety of vaccines. And then in the mid nineties, I started learning about nutrition. Mm. And that, you know, the first nutritional piece that I learned was about partially hydrogenated oils. And, you know, here I am uh, as an attending on the wards and I'm doing rounds with the medical students and residents and I'm eating Ritz crackers. And I'm, I loved wrist crackers. You know, they got such a great taste. <laughs> uh, I look at the label and I see, oh, it has partially hydrogenated oils. And I said, oh, wait a second, that's not good. So I did an experiment and I took partially hydrogenated oils out of my diet and I added olive oil. So I took the polyunsaturated hydrogenated oils out and I added a monounsaturated fat and I lost weight. Mm -hmm. And so I started to read more about omega-6 and omega-3, and I started to realize how we can control our own levels of inflammation by changing the fats that we eat. And then, of course, the whole thing about sugar came about. And then it just kept going and going, and I, I just kept seeing the paths diverge because I'd see all these kids in the ER, militia, and they were constantly getting sick and I couldn't do anything to help them. And once I realized that they weren't needing more antibiotics, I was helpless. Like, well, how do I stop you from getting sick? And then I realized, wow, I was never taught that in medical school or residency or fellowship. <laughs> how do I stop you from getting sick? How do I prevent you from being sick? That was no part of my eight years. Right. So all of these things in the 1990s were just spewing all over the place. And I had relationships with chiropractors hearing the body has the innate capacity to heal. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is that? Right. 
little by little, I realized how Western medicine teaches us that the body has the innate capacity to heal. We just don't apply it in our clinical mm -hmm. practice. So I'd learned from naturopaths. I'd learned from homeopaths. I'd learned from osteopaths. I've learned from acupuncturists. And I so I just started absorbing all these, the body has the innate capacity to heal concepts. And then once I went back into the sciences of the body, I realized that I didn't need Chinese medicine. I didn't need osteopathy. I didn't need homeopathy, although I utilized them. But I actually had the tools and the, the jewel inside the pearl and the oyster was in the teachings of Western medicine. Well, wow. actually, show that we're doing a disservice when we suppress symptoms. We're actually hurting the body because we're not listening to what the body's really saying when symptoms actually occur. Yeah. All oh, that's so interesting. I was on the patient side of the ear infection piece. That's actually kind of what started our own health journey in our family. Our daughter, who is now 16, when she was about five, just had chronic ear infections um, and was prescribed antibiotic after antibiotic. It was just, you know, if we got it under control for a little bit, it would come back and come back. And um, at some point, you know, my gut instinct just kicked in and I just realized this wasn't working and um, had never tried anything like this before, but looked for some kind of like other remedy. I was like, is there anything we can do besides antibiotics to help her? And um, and that's what really started our health journey because I started to research and look for things outside of the answers that were giving, given me in a doctor's office. So that's really interesting to me to hear because as you're saying, all this research was coming out about that, like that definitely was never shared with us and nobody ever taught you that the mucus buildup was actually the body's response to increased amounts of inflammation in the body and that the inflammation almost always comes from the diet mm -hmm. and that most ear fluid problems are allergic reactions or sensitivity sensitivity reactions to foods or nobody ever taught you that the reason for the buildup of the fluid is because the ear canals are very horizontal in small kids and that they need better drainage. And sometimes the adenoids stick up and block the drainage of the fluid from the ear canals. So what you need is help with the spasming of the muscles around the ear canals and help with drainage. And once you improve drainage and you change the diet, you actually stopped having ear pain. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you help with the drainage? Well, there's lymphatic massage, there's essential oil massages, there's steams, there's chiropractic work, there's osteopathic work, there's craniosacral work. There's all this kind of body work that actually relieves the symptoms like that. And then once you become familiar with the foods that are creating all this inflammation, you realize that the body doesn't have to produce the mucus anymore because the inflammation isn't there for the body to have to use the mucus to bring it out. That's all basic physiology, Militia. Yeah. That's what, but once you learn that, you go, oh, well, no wonder the ear infections keep coming back because mm -hmm. I never addressed the diet and I was treating it incorrectly and I never helped drain it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's sad that it was never shared because then all those antibiotics created other issues in her body, you know, that we've had to address for years um, and try to correct in her. Um, and so it would have been really nice to know. <laughs> um, and you kind of pointed out that like some of the things you use now, you actually did learn in Western medicine training, but they just weren't applied. Um, but I have heard that like in some, in your training that there's really not a, a lot of nutrition training. Is that correct? None. Pretty much none. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I started medical school in 1983, and the dean of the medical school, who was a well-respected internist in New York City at the time, within the first five minutes of introducing himself and introducing the class of 1987, specifically said, nutrition is not a field of medicine. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I so remember him saying that. And uh, I was like, what, 
what does that have to do with anything? You're, we're here to learn medicine. And why would you say nutrition is not a field of medicine? So it caught my ear and, and I remembered it for, yeah. for a long time. Why do you think that is? Like, why, why is nutrition ignored? Why are some of those trainings not applied that would help people um, manage symptoms and heal other than just treating with pharmaceuticals? Well, you just answered it. See, the, the medical system is run on the use of pharmaceuticals. There's no other way for you to get better unless you use pharmaceuticals. That is what medical school and residency is about. Yes, there's surgery. Yes, there are therapies. But yes, there's emergency interventions. But for the most part, you do not need anything other than pharmaceuticals to get you better. And so what would happen if you learned that you can lower your inflammation by changing your diet? Mm. Wouldn't need anti-inflammatory drugs. You wouldn't need other pharmaceutical drugs. What would happen if you realized that you could change your health by getting an air filter or by, you know, taking certain kind of baths or using some essential oils or, you know, going for a walk every day or creating better relationships at home or, and, and the list keeps going on and on. What would happen? is you would not need pharmaceutical medicine. And and so I have been practicing pediatric medicine for over 25 years, pretty much with an understanding that you don't need pharmaceutical medicine for most of your daily life. You don't need it. You can actually live without it and you can go through illnesses without it. And that doesn't sit well with an industry that's Every TV commercial, every advertisement, every doctor's office is pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical. Ask your doctor, ask your doctor, ask your doctor. So there's this infusion, sort of like a numbing infusion yeah. through the airwaves. You cannot live without pharmaceuticals. You cannot live without pharmaceuticals. And you know what would happen to the industry if people actually ate differently? What would happen if the to the industry if people stopped needing the drugs? They'd lose money. <laughs> so, so for the cynist, for the cynic, and for the conspiracy theorist, I was just turned off. You know, your channel was just turned off, right? Mm -hmm. But for someone who's really willing to do a deep dive into this, you realize that much of the way in which medicine is practiced is about keeping you in the system of needing drugs and more drugs and more pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. If we start to see three-year-olds on four, five, six medications and the elderly on eight, 10 medications, you realize that it's a captured audience. And you know, you go to a doctor and the doctor puts you on a medicine that's not an antibiotic. Say it's a, a, a SSRI. And you ask the doctor, how long am I going to be on this? There's no answer. It's endless. Endless taking of the drug. There's no attempt to wean you off the medicine. And in fact, if you have any side effects, we'll just give you another medicine to combat the side effects from that medicine. And if that doesn't work, we'll add another medicine. And so there's never a, a sense that your side effects from the medicine are because you shouldn't be taking the medicine. There's just a sense, oh, you have other symptoms. Let's give you more medicine. And that works for a lot of people. But, you know, in my world, parents come to me because they want to come off the medicine, because they want to heal their children so that their children don't, not only don't need the medicine, but don't have the symptoms anymore. Right. It's a completely different mindset. I mean, you're, if you have something, you know, that's at dis ease in your body. You can approach it as just wanting to get rid of the disease, the, the symptom, right. right? Or you can approach it as like wanting not to have it at all, wanting to like manage it and, you know, not not have it like affect the quality of your life, you know, in, in some ways, or, you know, like, I guess if that makes sense. And then, or you can just approach it in with a totally different mindset of, you know, trusting that your body has the ability to heal and then figuring out how to make that happen. 
Well, I'll never forget in the year 2000, when I started a holistic integrative pediatric practice, within those couple of years that I was in that office, I saw kids in the office who, for general pediatrics, went to the pediatricians who trained me in residency 10 years before, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years before. And the families would come to me and I would help them manage their kids' chronic illnesses and the kids would stop having their symptoms. And they would go back to their pediatricians and say, well, Dr. Polevsky helped me with this and Dr. Polevsky helped me with this and my kid no longer has this. And the pediatricians wouldn't want to know what I did. Yeah. They didn't want to hear any of it. They didn't care. And forget me, it had nothing to do with me. Right. But they have enough of a relationship with the family to say, oh, that's so interesting. What what did he do? What is it that I could learn to do for my patients that's different than what I'm doing? Right. No, no. The lack of curiosity is baffling. Oh. They just dismissed those families completely, just dismissed them. And I just smiled. I mean, what was I going to do other than just continue to take care of the parents? But but that has continued for over 20 years. The pediatricians don't want to know. You know, they just, oh, Dr. Larry's just doing voodoo stuff. No, actually, I'm practicing real Western medicine. I just don't utilize pharmaceuticals because I don't have to. If I'm really honest, thinking back to kind of the transition that our family made from that treatment uh, mindset to more of a preventative healing mindset in our health, it wasn't easy because... Um, at that, this was like a 10 years ago, I didn't know anyone else in my sphere of influence that was really doing that. Um, I didn't know where to get resources. I had a really hard time finding a pediatrician that I felt like I could even ask questions to um, for my children or, and then a doctor for my own health. And you would, you know, as a mom wanting to do what's best for your kids, um, here I am going into a, a medical professional's office um, and it's hard to question, honestly, what they say, you know, when when I'm just learning and I honestly didn't know or have all the answers, but I had questions, you know, but it was even hard to ask my questions without being made to feel silly or rude for even asking or questioning their opinion. So my question for you is what advice would you give to families kind of in that situation? Like, how can we raise healthy kids today when we kind of feel like we have to go against the grain in, in some ways and it feels hard? <laughs> Great question. Well, first, my I have a saying, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. So ask questions. Number two, um, build a healthcare team. Mm -hmm. If you're putting all of your eggs in one basket, you're not going to know the answers to your questions because you're you're really subservient and outsourcing to one person who you want to have all the answers to your questions and you want that person i.e. the medical doctor to save you and protect your children that's great your your doctor is meant to save you from dying but if your doctor doesn't have the answers to diet, healthy fats, healthy carbohydrates, how do I find healthy proteins? Um, what's a good water source? What do you think of sunscreen? Yeah. Is the sun healthy for my kid? You know, then then you build a healthcare team and you find nutritionists and, you know, you could say, well, how do I find a good one? Well, you start with one person and you listen, and then you go to another person, you listen, and you start to do your research and reading, and you start to realize, hey, maybe maybe those seed oils and those snack foods are not good for my kid. Maybe sunflower oil and safflower oil and soybean oil and canola oil and cottonseed oil, and, and maybe, maybe they're not so good. Maybe they're creating a lot of inflammation in my kid's body. You know, and you, you start to work with um, a chiropractor and you say, well, what is this? 
what, how could you help my kid? No, I don't like what you're saying. Let, let me try another chiropractor. Maybe I have a friend who knows a good chiropractor or a good osteopath. Why would I go to an osteopath or, you know, a naturopath? Maybe they have some idea of good supplements, right? Because the medical system is just going to tell you, oh, no, 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 that's junk. And the thing is, is that there are times when I'll recommend something and it doesn't work for a kid. And I'm, my answer to that is great information, right? In theory, what I prescribed or recommended should work. It didn't. So now I have to figure out what else could work. You need to work with people who are curious mm -hmm. and who have like, humility that, eh, you know, they don't know what they don't know sometimes and, and they want to learn and they want to go outside their comfort zone. The, the curiosity is the big thing. I mean, you said it earlier about, you know, the doctors not being curious. Well, the parents need to be curious also and recognize that, that you're in charge. For goodness sake, you're in charge. And I know it appears in our culture in 2023 that parents' rights are being taken away and the state is taking over. And my uh, suggestion to that is, uh, is that what you want? Because if you don't want it, I recommend doing something about it because it certainly appears to me that there's a concerted effort around the country to allow the state to take over your job as parenting. Yeah, that's so good. I really appreciate that. I feel like you like really nailed it. I, it's been a big part of our journey as well as having a a collection of people that we get information from. Um, and it's it's been a really good learning tool for me to be able to talk to people that are experts in different fields. You know what I mean? Like you said, like chiro chiropractic doctors and naturopathic doctors and all these different people who specialize in different fields. And what I tell people is like, it never hurts to get information. You know, if you go and do a consultation and you hear what they have to say and it you know, it's, you don't feel like it's a good fit. You can go talk to someone else, but it never hurts to get information and to be a learner. Right. I, I wholly agree. And my job as a physician is to make sure that I provide the family with enough resources so that there are, there's a team helping to take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. Now, especially if a kid has a chronic health issue. You know, so I work very closely with physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, chiropractors, osteopaths, homeopaths, acupuncturists, Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. So I pull from a number of people who are going to provide the things that I can't. Mm -hmm. I just don't do all that. Right. And where should I have to? Um, and then, you know, once I do that, I farm people out so that parents feel like there's enough support in a team that they can feel like they're seeing progress in, in their children. Yeah. And it's fun. It's fun to watch it. Yeah. Speaking of learning, um, for parents that want to learn more about vaccines, the ingredients, the effects, the schedule all those things what are some resources like how would you recommend a parent go about learning more about the american vaccine schedule <laughs> okay so first of all it's been 25 years that i have done a deep dive in the subject of vaccinations mm -hmm. the politics around it the policies around it, the medical system around it, the media around it, the science around it, which is unfortunately not any science at all. Um, take a deep breath because the minute you start wondering whether you've been lied to or whether you might have harmed your child, you're on a very interesting journey. Because there are a lot of emotions that are going to come up, emotions and feelings of betrayal, of anger, of rage, of despair, of guilt, and absolute fear 
that what do you do now? Get in and so yeah. So so understand that that it is a journey of education. It's a journey of new experiences. It's a journey of curiosity, of course. Because I can tell you that I know unequivocally that there are no safe vaccines and be very secure in that statement because of what I know about the literature or the lack of literature. But for a parent hearing that for the first time, it's like my pediatrician would never lie to me. This guy's a quack. Okay. I mean, that's perfectly an acceptable answer to what I'm saying, but I ask you to go past your resistance and start doing some more reading because, and start asking, start speaking to parents who know deep in their heart that their children were damaged by these vaccines. Because there are three things that are sort of mantras in our world today that parents have a difficult time getting past. One, Mantra, vaccines are safe and effective. Two, mantra, vaccine injury is rare. Three, mantra, unvaccinated children spread disease and put others at risk. So I know that those three are false. And the walls come tumbling down for most people when they also learn that those three things are false. Because vaccines have never been tested to be safe or effective. Vaccine injury is common. In fact, it's one of the leading causes of chronic illness in our country. And the unvaccinated not only do not cause disease and spread disease, but they're much healthier than children who are vaccinated. And if you ask a family who have children who are fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, and non-vaccinated, they'll tell you over and over again. And I'm talking in the hundreds of thousands of families who've done this. Oh, no, no, no. My unvaccinated kids, they're healthier. They recover from their illnesses quicker. They have easier times in life. They adapt better. Their social life is different, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a lot for someone to take in, especially if the parent has already done the shots. Mm-hmm. Right. And I work with a lot of families, militia, who came to that realization only after their children stopped talking, had seizures, uh, had learning disabilities, behaviors changed, uh, eye contact changed, developed very different symptoms than they would have expected. And those are the parents who go, oh, why didn't anybody tell me? And when I counsel parents, I just offer the information. I say to them, this is what I know. This is what I know about the ingredients. This is what I know about how the ingredients affect your body. This is what your doctor doesn't know about. And just know that after I give you this information, your decision is still your decision. But you can't say that you never heard this information. Can't say that you didn't know. And, you know, there are great books out there. Dissolving Illusions is a really good book by Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. Uh, the National Vaccine Information Center has great information on its website, nvic.org. And you can you can go to their last conference, which was, I think, in 2020 or 21, which was an online conference. Uh, there's a talk in there that I gave that goes through all the ingredients and what the major effects are on the brain and the immune system that should make anybody pause. You know, there's, um, you know, even on Mercola's website, Dr. Joseph Mercola has an amazing amount of information if you can catch it before it gets wiped out by the censorship. And then uh, Green Med Info, thousands and thousands of studies on their website looking at the challenges in the whole area of vaccine science. And, you know, what you'll hear is when you bring any of this information to pediatricians, they'll tell you, ah, come on, you read, don't read the internet, you know, stop reading that stuff. Uh, None of that. It's all been debunked. Uh, No, they're safe. Don't worry about it. And 
you know, most parents are not aware, Militia, that, that no one's liable if something bad happens to you after giving a shot. Hmm. No one's liable. Yeah. You know, if your child gets injured, no one's liable. Right. And and you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna hold have a business without insurance. You're not gonna drive a car without insurance, right? You're not gonna buy a house without insurance. Everything is based on an understanding that, you know, there's a need for retribution if something bad happens. There's a need for payback. The pharmaceutical industry since 1986 and then 100% since 2011 are a complete immunity to any liability for their product. So, you know, if a car manufacturer makes a damaged car, you can go after them. Mm -hmm. If the vaccine manufacturers make a damaged product for which they have no incentive to make it safe, you can't go after them. You're done. You, your your kid is in the medical system for the rest of your kid's life because there's nothing the medicine medical system can do for your child other than medicate. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put all of those resources in the show notes for those of you who are listening and want to learn more. I'll list all of that. And um, I'm also going to have all of Dr. Polevsky's information there so you can continue learning from him. Thank you for sharing from your decades of experience, from all of your research um, and wisdom that you've gained um, in your practice and all your experience with your patients and just in your life and all the people that you've talked to. I feel like we've just got such a condensed um, episode of wisdom here, and I really appreciate it. I have three questions that I always end with. Is there anything else that you want to share before I ask those? Anything that you feel like you haven't got to say yet? Well, what I what I want to say is, um, uh, please don't believe a word I said. Go find your truth. I am inspiring you to hear what I said. Weigh it. Don't dismiss it outright because it doesn't jive with your belief system. Weigh it. Consider it. And do your own research and see if you find that there's some truth to some of the things, few of the things, or even all of the things that I am discussing. So that's my 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 takeaway there. I love it. All right. Um, what is one healthy living resource that you would recommend to people who want to learn more about healthy living? Go out in nature. I'm serious. Go out in nature. Get your feet in the ground. Walk along the ocean. Sit by a lake. Hike in a mountain. Walk in a forest. Sit on the grass. Listen to the listen to nature. There's so much healing properties around us. There's so many healing opportunities. Get out of the house. Get away from the screen. I was in uh, I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago for um, a part business, part pleasure trip, and I'm walking along the beach, and people are walking along the beach in their shoes, and I'm scratching my head like, "What's the purpose of this? Like, get your feet in the ground, please." But the other thing that I saw was people sitting on the sand right in front of the ocean. There's the clouds, there's the sun, there's the blue sky, there's the waves, there's the ocean, the sand is right here. And there's the cell phone right here sitting on the beach. So um, if you don't understand or don't know about the things that I'm talking about, think about whether or not your head is in the sand, whether you're in a rabbit hole of an electronic device to move you away from paying attention to what needs to be seen in the world. So go out in nature, enjoy nature, breathe nature, play with nature, get out of the cement, get out of the wood, get out of the concrete, get out of the electromagnetic waves and go into nature. That's your healthy resource. 
I love that so much. Yeah. Makes me want to go outside right now. <laughs> Rushing out. Let's go. <laughs> what does Dr. Filevsky eat as a healthy snack? You know, I don't snack. Um, a number of months ago, I was... I was with a, a family, the mother's Ukrainian, the father's French. And as I'm taking the diet history, I get to the snacks and I said, what do you give your child for snacks? And the mother said, oh no, we don't snack. And I just looked at her because I loved her answer. And she said, yes, my husband is French. We don't snack. <laughs> and so... I don't snack, meaning if I'm hungry, I eat food. Something that I would have eaten in a meal. Yes, I love that so much. But I don't take stuff out of packages. And at least I try not to. And the fact of the matter is that we overfeed kids and overfeed ourselves. So we're constantly feeding and feeding. If it's not food, it's stimulation. If it's not stimulation, it's it's a video game. It's more information. It's constant feeding. And that is a very damaging approach to raising a healthy child because sometimes we need to just not be fed. We need that rest. So to me, a healthy snack is uh, eating real food. A meal. <laughs> Neil, and please stop overfeeding your kids. I'm amazed that kids eat like seven, eight times a day. Uh, I don't understand how we do that. Three meals a day is great, really great. And I think, um, I think we, I, I would recommend looking at how much we overfeed our kids. Yes, great answer. I love that. Last question is, who would you love to see as a guest on the Daily Wellness Podcast? I mean, if you saw this person's name pop up, you'd be like, I want to listen to this. Oh, this is this is an easy one and a tough one. You probably have a lot of names. <laughs> well, that's the point is that I have a lot of names, but I listen to them all the time. So um, I I love listening to Barbara Lowe Fisher. I think she has a tremendous knowledge base. She has a great historical perspective on on um, on just her journey as a mother, her journey as a, an activist, her journey as a leader, her journey as a, a participant in the process. She has a lot of history that people don't listen to and don't know about. And a lot of history and a lot of information that people accuse her of doing that actually is not true. So she'd be one of them. Um, I I enjoy listening to RFK Jr. because he has an amazing historical perspective, not only from the Kennedy family and the politics of his uncle and his father and his you know, grandfather, but he has an amazing history of the political system, the legal system, the uh, environmental system, and so his information is endless. And I'm a I'm an information junkie. I love to learn. I'm very curious. So he's someone that I I I like to listen to. And I'll stop there because I I don't want to I don't keep going, but. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It feels like it's been a privilege to talk, chat with you and learn from you, and I knew it would be. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Militia. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks for listening to today's episode on the Daily Wellness Podcast. We hope that you found it helpful for your own wellness journey. And if so, we'd love for you to leave a review. Then come back and listen for review shout outs on upcoming episodes. For more information, check out the show notes and connect with us on our website, dailywellnesscommunity.com.